Okay, so let's wait one more minute. I see like people are um, just getting connected now. Not live yet, right? Yes, we are. Okay, then I will not make any jokes. <laughs> you don't need to make jokes. <laughs> Just make sure they are uh, rated, you know, for the audience. Chiqui, me da una charla. No puedo. Estoy conectado, vale? Cierra los ojos. It's good to hear that Pablo has kids around. Yeah, so there may be some improvised. Uh, <laughs> You'll not be the first time giving a talk with kids on your shoulder. School participants, you know. <laughs> We're getting used to okay. them. Well, I guess maybe we could, uh, maybe we could start. Um, Okay, so my, my name is Antoine Reserba. I'm chairman of this last session of uh, that school co-organized by ICFO and MIT. And it's really a great pleasure to get uh, Pablo uh, Jario Herrero on board. And uh, Pablo is, is currently professor uh, of physics at MIT. And he's an experimentalist that's uh, specialized in condensed matter and in particular quantum electronic transport and up to electronics with 2D, of course. and uh, he got at the beginning of this year, the, the very famous uh, Wolf Prize, uh, together with uh, Rafi uh, Bistritzer and Alan McDonald for their work on Twisted Bilayer. And this is uh, what is he gonna show us today. So thanks a lot, Pablo, for being here. And uh, yeah, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Antoine. So I, I wanna thank uh, everybody for, for being here. You know, it's, uh, I've had an enormous amount of um, fun this you know these past two weeks you know it's it's really incredible for me to see um, the the breadth the depth you know how many experiments you know all the recent developments in theory and it's 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 really a great uh, you know a, a great feeling you know to to form part of this community which is thriving which is you know growing so fast and with so many developments that are happening pretty much every, you know, every week, you know, even during these two weeks of school, you know, if you look at the archive, they're having several very interesting papers appearing, you know, so it's, it's, you know, it's really hard to catch, to catch up, you know, but it's, uh, it's, it's really a great feeling. So I want to tell you, you know, I, uh, as you can see, I modified this slightly, the title, you know, I want to tell you about these three pins, you know, competing orders, pneumaticity and phase transitions in magic angle graph theory. And by the way, I, I should mention, so this is the background, you know, this is the beach of Castel de Fes. This is where we should have been all uh, this week. But, um, you know, it's, uh, it's a shame that we cannot be there, but hopefully for a, for a future school. And of course, one of the nice things is that many more of you could, could attend these lectures. So there's also uh, really advantages to this online format. Um, so let me, let me go on. So, you know, something that as, you know, I hope, you know, one of the, key messages of these two weeks of uh, Frontier School, I think for has been that this field of correlated motor heterostructures has meant the merging of, you know, several different communities in modern condensed matter physics, which, which before they were not always uh, working you know, that closely together or they didn't have as much overlap. One is of course the field of 2D Van der Waals materials and heterostructures, you know, graphene, TMDs, TMDs, transport, optics, etc. We've had several talks this week. Then also the community of strongly correlated materials, you know, people that look at strong interactions in materials, and then the topological condensed matter physics community. They all three come together in these correlated water heterostructures, you know, and as we have heard this week, the, the, the field goal is, is much broader than, than magic angle graphene. Actually, by now we have many other correlated water heterostructures. You know, we heard yesterday, for example, from Jishan about beautiful experiments on uh, transition metal dichalcogenides, uh, heterostructures, you know, probe with optics. So it's, it's well beyond transport, it's well beyond magic angle graphene. And I think really this is one of the most fascinating things. The fact that there are so many people, you know, uh, doing such interesting work with various techniques, with various, you know, systems. And believe me, this is just the beginning. Um, the 
will be plenty of surprises in the near future with new systems, new quantum phenomena, and, and new things you know, that are going to be fascinating. And, and I look forward to, to many other schools and, and conferences where we can all discuss about these developments. So let me tell you, you know, you, you know, usually I give one of the first few talks at the conference and, and then I have to give this introduction to magic angle graphene. By now, I think all of you are very familiar with it. So let me go very quickly through the introduction and then we'll focus on more detailed things. So as you know, if you have your know, two graphene sheets on top of each other rotated by an angle and you look, you know, near the K points of each of the graphene layers, you can, well, let me see if I, yeah. Uh, here, you have two Dirac cones, which are separated in momentum space by a quantity which is proportional to the rotation angle for small angles. Now, this is what happens in the absence of a um, tunnel in between the two layers, okay? If you have interlayer hybridization, then a gap opens here, okay? So, this, you can think of this as the, you know, bonding and anti-bonding states in a hydrogen molecule, except that now you have two gigantic molecules, which are the two graphene sheets, yeah? So this gap opens, this interlayer hybridization, and this is the situation that occurs when this interlayer hybridization is much smaller than the actual point at which these two Dirac cones, you know, cross, yeah? However, if you now decrease the twist angle, you know, towards smaller and smaller and smaller angle, what you have is that these Dirac cones that touch each other and open a gap here, now they're getting closer, closer, and closer, so, this crossing point goes towards lower and lower and lower energy, such that at some point, okay, this interlayer hybridization becomes equal, you know, the same order of magnitude as this point, crossing point here, and then you develop a flat band. Yeah? Now, this flat band condition is reached at the magic angle, term coined by Mr. and McDonough, okay? and it happens to be about 1.1 degree. Yeah? And it's interesting to know that there was also, you know, very interesting work, Eva Andre mentioning her talk, you know, that this evidence for this, you know, magic angle, you know, in, in, in STM spectroscopy, you know, two von Hoff singularities that form at these points, they saw that they went towards zero at an angle, which was very close to this angle. Uh, and then Soros Moray and his collaborators in Chile have predicted also uh, this presence of flat bands. And there was a lot of very interesting work, you know, well, you know, many, many years before our discovery. Now, this is, you know, this, this is a schematic cartoon of how this whole process happens. Let me show you an actual video of the electronic structure as a function of angle, okay? So here you have the two reciprocal spaces. Here you have the two reciprocal spaces of layer one and layer two of graphene. If you join the corners of the brillouin zones, then you get the mini, the super lattice Brillouin zone, sometimes called the mini Brillouin zone, okay? You can see it's much smaller because you form a more long range, you know, in space, more a pattern, which means in momentum space, you have to fully transform, it's a small reciprocal space. <clears throat> and now this is the electronic structure uh, for an angle, a relatively large angle, three degrees. Within this energy window, you can see this just looks like graphene. Dirac cones coming out of the super lattice Brillouin zone K points, okay? Now, as I run this video, the first thing that you're gonna see is that the angle is gonna to go towards smaller, which means towards smaller angles, which means this super lattice Brillouin zone is going to become even smaller and smaller and smaller, okay? And it's going to rotate. And then you're going to see what happens with the energy bands. So if I run this video, you can see that the Brillouin zone is becoming smaller, now, you see now within this energy window, a set of bands begins to flatten. They're separated from band gaps. Now there's a flat band condition there. And then the system continues to evolve in a complicated manner. Let me just run it again, okay? You see two important things happen. One is these gaps, and the other one is these bands, which become flatter and flatter, and they're at about 1.1 degrees. They become very flat, okay? So you take a snapshot of this, at about 1.05 degrees, and these simulations include lattice relaxation, you can see that there is this very flat band, okay? Which is, you know, when you have a very flat band, that means your kinetic energy is quenched, and therefore the Coulomb interactions between your electrons acquire disproportionate, you know, importance. You know? So <clears throat> this is something that, you know, 
led to you know our our papers in 2018 you know where we discovered correlated insulated states when you put half as many electrons in the valence band or in the conduction band of these flat band systems as you could you have an insulated state where you would expect in single particle physics a metal and then these correlated insulated states you know they were bounded by superconducting domes you know by now these results have been reproduced by you know a dozen of groups or so and it has even extended in very interesting directions including uh, topology etc so let me step back a little bit and you know show you this so let's go back to graphene or large angle twisted bilayer graphene okay this is what the phase diagram looks like yeah you have you know on this axis temperature on this axis density of electrons and graphene is is a metal with only one special point which is this charge neutrality point okay that's a special point but otherwise nothing else pretty much in the phase diagram for large twisted bilayer graphene large angle twisted bilayer graphene since it looks like graphene this is also the phase diagram of large angle twisted bilayer graphene now what happens if we have small angle twisted bilayer graphene but not yet magic angle okay well then as you see here you have band gaps that develop here and now i'm changing from density to filling factor which is a notation that many many people have used already in in the school you know many of the other speakers which you know this filling factor tells you whether you put one two three or four electrons or one two three four holes per more unit cell okay and you see when you put four electrons or four holes per more unit cell you reach these band gaps okay so you have a band insulator yeah. So this is something that we saw already a number of years ago in small angle twisted bilayer graphene has been reproduced by others, and it's interesting behavior, but you can more or less understand it in a single particle picture. Okay, so if you go to magic angle graphene, okay, this is the phase diagram again schematic. This was what was the phase diagram was in you know in the summer of 2018. Okay, you have this correlated insulated behavior when you put two electrons two holes per mole unit cell. And you have superconducting domes around them. Okay, when you dope a little bit, you know, remove your filling factor a little bit away from two holes initially, then it was discovered that it also happens on this side. And then many other domes uh, were seen. And I should mention that you know this related correlated insulated work on IBC trilayer graphene on aligned to hexagonal boron nitride was published, you know, at about the same time by by Feng Wan's group and collaborators at Berkeley. So this you know this field evolved very quickly okay the from global transport measurements alone okay this phase diagram is evolving and very fast okay and it's extremely twist angle dependent and also it depends on other you know boundaries and, and parameters so this is what i told you about the mid you know summer 2018 so later, you know, we and others saw that there is this linear in temperature resistivity behavior. It is primarily present around the correlated insulator states. Okay. And this is very reminiscent of the strange metal behavior in correlated materials. Whereas if you go, for example, in a charge neutrality, you have regular metallic behavior. The resistivity is not linear, it's quadratic okay, in temperature, approximately quadratic. You also have the this superconducting state is anisotropic okay the series anisotropic anisotropies which did, you know have led us to the conclusion that there is nematicity in the superconducting state of magic angle graphene you also have competition between different orders you know close to these integer filling factors particularly close to minus two and you have also nematicity or anisotropies in the normal state of the superconducting state now you also have a lot of stuff happening, a lot of interesting thing happening at filling factors one, three, minus one, minus three, correlated semi-metal, correlated insulator states. And when you align to HBN topological states, very recently we have heard about churn insulators and topological states, even when you don't align to HBN. Okay. And STM, you know, very interesting STM work and, and another work has also shown that what is happening microscopically. So we have more and more evidence of a multitude of phases of phase transitions of different orders and different interesting topological and correlated states which are happening in this phase diagram okay now this phase diagram is a schematic don't look at particular details and it's angle dependent and it depends 
also many parameters, uh, you know, disorder with the three standard or chemical homogeneities and you know, temperature, etc. Okay, so it's, it's a very rich problem, you know, and I think we are, you know, a lot more research is needed in order to fully understand, you know, these phase diagrams and of course, the different related materials that, that uh, people are investigating, like twisted by layer by layer, twisted mono layer by layer, twisted TMDs, etc. So we, another key message of this lecture is that, you know, I think we're going to be busy for many years to come. So I hope that, you know, many of you who are listening uh, to these uh, lectures will, will, you know, will want to participate in this research, which I think is very exciting. Now, one of the things that I mentioned is that, you know, the properties are very dependent on, on twist angle, okay? So for example, this is just an example from, you know, uh, over a dozen of our superconducting devices. So what is the TC versus twist angle? Okay, usually you hear superconducting domes in, in, in cuprates and other materials, you have TC versus some parameter like doping or sometimes pressure, things like that. Here we can do something with these 2D materials, which is really unique to 2D materials, which is plot a TC at optimal doping versus twist angle between these two crystalline lattices, okay? And what you can see is that there is a range of twist angles over which we can see superconductivity, okay? This, these two dots here are particularly disordered devices, so don't pay too much attention to them. These are the devices for which there's less disorder, they seem to form a dome, and having recent, you know, uh, experiments by, by, you know, by, by Dima Efetov and by Andrea Young and by other people that have put, you know, and, and Corey Dean that have, you know, probably you could add another half a dozen or dozen points and they sort of seem to fall roughly here. We have seen the lowest, um, you know, the lowest angle for which we in my group have seen superconductivity is 0.95 degrees. Uh, Jeannie Lau showed um, some evidence for superconducting devices for even 0.93. Uh, degrees, twist angles the other day, and the maximum is about 1.2 degrees, okay, that we have seen, you know, so these boundaries may extend a little bit further, but it's quite clear that it has to do with the vicinity of about 1.1 degrees, and the maximum seems to be there between 105 and 1.1 degrees for most people. Now, things depend a lot on, on, on twist angle, and in fact, as, as you know, Jenny Lau pointed out, you know, there is, you know, what should we call magic angle and what are the implications, okay? In fact, what should we call magic angle range, probably? So, you know, we could, you know, choose uh, option one, which is the original is, what is the angle for which the Fermi velocity is zero or minimum at the K points? That was the one chosen by Mr. Sir McDonald. But you could argue that, you know, maybe we need to call magic angle the angle for which the bandwidth W is minimum, okay? Because you want small, your flat bands in order to have, you know, interaction effects be most pronounced. Or you could also argue that perhaps the angle for which the density of states, in particular, the of singularities are strongest and narrowest, okay? So what is locally the flattest band structure, not globally over the entire Brillouin zone, the flattest band structure, but locally in momentum space, the flattest band structure, okay? This is something, for example, that was argued in Abhay Pasupathy's work on Magic Angle Graphene. So any of these three definitions could probably be a good definition. The problem is that we don't know yet how any of these three definitions relates to the magic part, okay? Is, is the most magic, you know, uh, you know, the magic angle when experimentally when the strongest correlated insulator occurs? And for what feelings? Because the behavior is pretty particle hole asymmetric, okay, around charge neutrality. So electron filling factors, they behave quite differently from hole filling factors. Or should we call magic angle the angle for which we have the highest TC? And again, for what feeling? Because there are multiple superconducting domes, okay? So all of this, the connection between theory and experiment, you know, and despite tremendous amount of very interesting theoretical work, is not yet settled. I would say at all, okay? We still don't know what exactly, what precisely leads from this type of physics, you know, flat bands in whatever definition you wanna use for magic angle to the strongest correlated insulator states or the highest superconducting states or a number of other, you know, phenomena that are being shown by different groups. So this is something that I think, 
you know, will continue, you know, there will be many, many interesting developments in the near future. Now, this is the outline of what I want to tell you about. I want to start by mentioning, you know, uh, that there are competing orders in magic angle graphene, okay? You know, when you go near the correlating insulated states, there is, you know, superconductivity, but there are also other phases which compete with superconductivity. Then, and related to this, I will speak about nematicity, magic angle graphene. Then I'll tell you about our collaborative work with a group of Shahali Lani, where we measure the compressibility uh, of magic angle graphene. And in particular, we saw a cascade of phase transitions and Dirac revivals. This will be similar, this will link to uh, work that uh, Ali Jesdani mentioned in his talk last week. And then if time allows, although probably I will be mostly busy with this, but if time allows, I will mention something about strange metal behavior in magic angle graphene. You can see here, if I don't get there, you can at least see this very linear in temperature resistivity behavior, you know, perfectly linear down to the lowest temperature pretty much before superconductivity sets in. And Alan McDonald mentioned in, in his talk that, you know, this, this is something which is extremely, you know, it's, it's, it's really puzzling similar to how this strange metal behavior is puzzling in other correlated materials. And I was happy to see, although I haven't seen yet a paper in the archive that Alan promised uh, would be there in a few days. I haven't seen it, maybe I just couldn't find it. Um, on his new theory for how uh, his novel collective excitations might be responsible for it. So let me get started with this. So this, you know, term, you know, competing and sometimes it's, you know, it's called intertwined orders, you know, it comes mostly from studies of the cuprates, you know. This is a phase diagram of the cuprates and you can see this, this is temperature versus hold open, okay. And you can see that there is this super, you know, the green part is the superconducting. Don't this, of course, a theoretical map, you know. Um, and you can see that it's not a single superconducting dome. You have this sort of double dome, you know, this camelback you know, superconducting dome, okay. In particular, near this doping, you know, this one-eighth doping, 12.5%, there is this anomaly, this sort of kink in TC. Yeah? Now, this is for, you know, given cuprate. Cuprate is a large family of materials. So for some materials, TC goes all the way almost to zero, actually, at that one eight doping, okay? And here, this depression of TC has been long argued, and, and I think it's quite strong evidence that it is related to another competing order, okay? It can be stripes, it can be charge, density, you know, wave, other, you know, various types of charge order, which are competing with superconductivity and hence the you know, deplete or depress TC for this particular doping. So let me show you a bit about our devices. So this is, you know, uh, you know magic angle device number seven, you know, I, you know, we have you know, many, many, many dozens of devices by now. This twist angle is 1.09 degrees. This is a very high quality device, actually three Kelvin superconducting, you know, TC. And as you can see in this high temperature phase diagram, the temperature versus density, this is the charge neutrality point. You can see that there are correlated semi-metal or insulated states at filling factor one, two, three, okay? For holes, you have some feature near one, but the most prominent feature is the correlated insulated state near two and superconducting dome. Uh, this is the high temperature behavior. Let me zoom in actually in this area here, okay? I want to focus in this area where the strongest superconductivity is seen. So this is again our exact temperature versus doping. You can see now uh, in enlarged density range. The first thing that I want you to notice is this, there is this yellow, which means a resistance maximum here, okay? Locally in density, a resistance maximum, which is moving in temperature and density, okay? We call this sometimes the, the, the banana, you know, because, you know, because we plot this in yellow and it looks like a banana. So you can see that this can be traced, yeah? Let me zoom in a bit even more, okay? So now I'm zooming even more, you know, a bit lower temperature and I'm enlarging the hole doping region. Remember, this is zero doping and we're doping extra holes in that direction, okay? Zero doping, I mean filling factor minus two, okay? Well, we know that there is a reset in the density. So this is the banana. And as you can see, there is, you know, this dark is the superconducting dome. You can see that there is this, you know, where this banana, 
where this resistivity bridge is, there is a dent in the TC. TC is smaller there than there than there. Okay. So this, and by the way, you can look at all of this is posted on the ARC episode a month or two ago. This is very reminiscent of what happens in the cuprets. Okay. You see in the cuprets, they use hold open in the opposite direction that we use it, you know, because they, they cannot so easily do this with the gate. So of course, this is a theoretical plot. This is an actual experimental plot. Okay. So there seems to be something competing. Okay. There's a resistivity maximum reach, which goes all the way to low temperature and that competes and depletes superconductivity in this region. Now, one thing that we can do is we can take these data, which are at zero magnetic field and say, okay, there seems to be something competing with superconductivity. Why don't we suppress superconductivity and see what's really underneath that, okay? So this is the correlated insulated state, which is quite weak for these devices. And it happens only near zero temperature and at about 10% open from it, you have this feature. If we apply a small magnetic field, okay, then you see the following. This rich, okay, develops a strongly insulated state at the lowest temperature once superconductivity is gone, okay? If I take this trace here, at this particular doping, you can see that at zero magnetic field, you have superconductivity. At finite magnetic field, you have an insulated state for the exact same doping, okay? Okay, so at the beginning, you know, we saw this and we thought like, well, who knows, you know, is, is this real, is this not? Does it have to do with disorder? But then we saw it again, we saw it again, we saw it again, you know? So you start to think that there's actually something more going on there, okay? This is for the different device, 1.07 degrees, okay? You have also this resistance reach, which happens above, you know, superconducting dome. In this case, the correlated insulated state is very weak, actually, barely there, okay? And then, if this resistance reach, there is a dent in TC. And if you go to finite magnetic field, you can see that the insulated state remains there. In fact, at nu equals minus two, it becomes a little bit stronger, but what becomes a lot stronger is actually this feature, you know, coming from this resistivity maximum here, okay? So again, if you take a trace there, you can see that at zero magnetic field, this is superconducting, whereas at finite, just a small magnetic field enough to kill superconductivity, this becomes insulated, okay? So there seems to be something which is competing with the superconducting state, and it seems to originate from this feature here, okay? You can actually do this continuously, okay? You can look at what is TC as a function of magnetic field. So this is TC, these bands are TC, and these are experimental data as a function of magnetic field. And you can see how we have this thing, it has a depletion here, a depletion here, and you can at some point split the superconducting dome into two domes, okay? The correct insulator state is actually here, okay? So this is happening within the superconducting dome. And you can see that it exhibits these two domes here. And then if you increase the magnetic field, you kill completely this dome, you only have one dome left. You know, this is very reminiscent of this data, again, taken on cuprates where they suppress the magnetic field by going up to you know, 80 Tesla and they can split the superconducting dome in two domes again. Remember, there they dope in this direction, here we dope with holes in this direction. So you should actually see the symmetric of this, you know, the mirror of this is what you have to compare with this, okay? And of course here you can see, although you have these beautiful continuous lines, remember, in reality these are discrete points, just a couple of points, these are true continuous lines of experimental data. These are a couple, you know, points because in the cuprates for each doping, they need to grow a new crystal and they need to do a new experiment. Well, we can control this continuously, okay? So again, to what extent these similarities are, you know, are, are you know, truly something which, you know, makes these systems intimately connected or not, you know, remains to be seen, okay? But certainly it's very suggestive some of the phenomenology in some cases looks so similar. In many other cases, it looks very different, okay? So don't, you know, don't, don't you know, far, um, you know, I don't want to say that, the, you know, cuprates and twisted ballet graphene are the same. Not, they're not at all, you know, there are many, many differences. But there are also similarities. Yeah? Pablo, I think we have a question from uh, Chan Lee Wong about this part. Uh, Chan Lee, uh, I think you can talk now. 
Uh, so can you also tune the competition with in-play magnetic field? Um, so we, we can, indeed, okay? And I'm gonna show some in-play magnetic field, but in a different context. The, the biggest um, effect that we see, well, let me, you know, let me continue because I'm, coming, I'm, I'm going to come to parallel magnetic field because this is related to several other things that I'm going to say in the talk. And you will see that this is connected indeed, okay? Okay, thanks, Pablo. So, okay, let me leave it for now there, okay? And I'm gonna come back to this, to these competing orders in a moment. Let me now tell you about nematicity. So we, you know, we heard a fantastic talk by Rafael Fernandez. Here's actually a picture from his, from his review, you know, about nematicity in correlated materials and in moray materials in particular, okay? Let me just remind you, you know, uh, just some, some of the basics for those of you that were able to, to attend this talk. So nematicity means spontaneous breaking of lattice rotational symmetry of an order parameter, okay? Many families of quantum materials show this, you know, the nictite superconductor, the cuprates, heavily doped topological insulators, which are also superconductors. And nematicity is something that can happen in the normal state of the material, in the superconducting state of the material, or in both, and it has different implications, depending, you know, on how, you know in each case. Okay? Nematicity has been most studied perhaps in the nictite superconductors, although it has been studied mostly in the normal state of the nictite superconductors, okay? And it, you know, it shows up as an isotropies in the resistivity, and it, you know, it's a very, very you know, hot topic of research. You know, hundreds and hundreds of papers have been published about this. You know, more recently, perhaps, doped topological insulators, which are also superconductors, you know, they have been shown to exhibit nematicity, okay? And in this case, for example, you can see that, you know, TC varies as you apply, you know, magnetic field parallel to the, to the you know, planes of the topological insulator, you know, I think this is for either copper doped or strontium doped and, and bismuth selenite, you can see that you know, TC oscillates, okay? It has two peaks here between zero and 360 degrees, it has two peaks, which means the system chooses a direction or a director, as Raphael mentioned, okay? So bismuth selenite has, you know, you know threefold symmetry, Okay, so it's a structure, but the super, you know, the TC, rather than having three peaks, it has two maxima, okay, which means it develops twofold symmetry, okay. It goes from C3 or, you know, whatever symmetry you have in your crystal lattice, what you go to C2 symmetry, you choose a direction, okay, then you know this is a signature of this nematicity, okay. So let me show you our results on magic angle graphene, okay. Again, this is, you know, a device that we, you know, and, and we have measured this from many devices now. This is a device, you cool it down, it's a whole bar geometry, and now you are playing, apply a magnetic field parallel to the device, okay, in plane, and you can vary the magnitude of the magnetic field as well as the angle of the magnetic field, yeah? And again, this is a pretty high TC device, 3 Kelvin, 50% anomalous state resistance, beautiful switching curves, you know, they even have some hysteresis, okay? And, you know, by all standards, really very high quality superconducting device. If you measure, you know, the resistivity versus temperature, it has one of these, you know, bridges because it's a log scale. It looks a little bit different from before, but this is the depletion in TC that I mentioned before, okay? And if you measure the resistivity versus angle of the magnetic field, you know, and then versus magnetic field, you can, similar to the case of the Musulina, you can see these two maxima between zero and 360 degrees. This means we have an ellipse. Okay, let me actually show you the ellipse. Here we go. This is the resistivity versus magnetic field in the x direction and y direction, and you can see this ellipse. Okay, you have a very different critical magnetic field when you go in this direction and when you go in this direction. Okay, now the nice thing again about magic and graphene is we can do all of this. This is for a particular doping. We can do this as a function of all dopings, okay? So we can do this as a function of doping at a given temperature. You know, we choose the temperature here. We have a vector magnet in our cryostat with the maximum in-plane field of one Tesla. So we have to choose an intermediate temperature so that we can see the ellipses at the different dopings because TC varies, but then we can go to base temperature and then we can see, you know, or intermediate, you know, uh, at different dopings, 
the strength of the lips. We can go at optimal doping where within one Tesla, we don't see anything because it's always superconducting uh, even at one Kelvin, but then we increase to two Kelvin and then we see the lips, you know, we can vary all these parameters, okay? And the thing, you know, this is quite complicated. You can look for details of this paper, but the thing that I want you to take away is that, as you can see, the lips at this doping, okay, in this panel E, has a different orientation than the lips in panel H, okay? Which is similar to this one here, okay? In fact, each of these panels is taken along one of these at different dopings. And what you can see is that the lips major axis changes direction, rotates with density, okay? So let me, you know, let me tell you, not only we have an isotropies in this critical magnetic field, this parallel critical magnetic field, another thing that we can do is we can go to base temperature, so we are very cold, and we can measure what is the behavior of the critical current as a function of parallel magnetic field, okay? And here, I'm gonna run a video. Again, I just want you to get a taste of flavor for this, okay? Because this is gonna to be too much information and you have to look at the details, but this is an angle. This is critical, you know, this is current biasing, okay? And here I have different panels, mean different parallel magnetic field, and I'm going to vary the density in this video, okay, the doping. And I just want you to see that you see you have this anisotropies, you know, I know it went too fast, don't worry. Here I'm taking, uh, I'm running it another time, and I'm just gonna take a snapshot here, okay? Here you have different panels at the same density, but different parallel magnetic fields. Look at this, for example. Here you have superconducting state for some angles, insulated states from, for other angles, okay? So, if you want to look at the actual critical current curves, here you have this is the differential resistance as a function of current bias. You see this is zero, okay? This is superconducting state, and then you have switch, okay? Interestingly, for, you know, for some devices and in some doping ranges, you have, uh, you know, two switches, okay? Let me not comment too much on that at the moment. What I'm varying between the different colors here is the angle with the magnetic field. And as you can see with the magnetic field, you have an oscillation. In fact, this behavior can be well defined by a cosine, okay? And this oscillation gives you two maxima, okay? Which means you have an ellipse also in the critical current versus parallel magnetic field, okay? Now, so these are the properties of the superconducting state, okay? There are anisotropies as a function of parallel magnetic field. And these anisotropies are dependent on doping, okay? Now, what about the normal state? And here is where I'm going to connect back to the previous uh, competing orders part of the, of the talk. Okay? Now, this is RxX, okay? Here's the, you know, banana, the resistance maximum bridge that I mentioned before, you know, superconductivity, it's a depletion superconductivity there, okay? This is nu equals minus two. This is again, this resistance reach, you know, the banana. If you measure RxY, so if you do a whole resistance measurement, but that's zero magnetic field, okay? So it's not really a whole resistance measurement. It's just an RxY measurement. At zero magnetic field, here's what you measure, okay? You see there's a region of very strong RxY, even though there is zero magnetic field, okay? And it actually, I just take this line and I put it here without any adjustments, coincides perfectly with this region where we have a resistance maximum here. Now you may wonder, how can it be that we have finite hole resistance if we have zero magnetic field? Well, this is actually something that can happen when you have an anisotropic material. So we have a hole bar. Let's imagine we have this material, which is anisotropic, okay? And you have different resistivity, therefore, along you know, the x direction and along the y direction. Okay? Your resistivity tensor has these values, row one and row two in the X and Y direction, yeah? If you have this actually, and your axis, the axis of anisotropy are aligned to your whole bar axis, then you would expect to measure zero hole resistance, okay? Sorry, zero RXY, zero transverse resistance in this device. And of course, if the material is isotropic, you measure zero RXY resistance, no matter what. However, 
if the axis of your, you know, if your anisotropy axis are rotated with respect to your device axis, then you have to do a transformation of your resistivity tensor, okay? And you can pick up a finite rho xy, a finite transverse component, even at zero field, as long as you have a resistance and isotropy. Rho one minus rho two is different from zero, okay? And you are not at zero 90 degree angle, okay? So this is something that indeed happens in our devices, okay? So at zero magnetic field, if you measure Rxy, and this is Rxy corrected for any possible effect that you, know, you would wanna account for in order to make sure you're doing a proper Rxy measurement, okay? In particular, we correct for offsets between the Rxx um, electrodes, et cetera, okay? You can see that there is this very strong region of anisotropy here. Yeah, finite Rxy. You can normalize Rxy by Rxx so that you see the true extent and value of the anisotropy. You can see that it's over 50% anisotropy in, for the strongest values, okay? So it's a very, very strong anisotropy compared with, you know, with many other materials. So I should mention also, by the way, that in normal state nematicity, has been seen in, you know, STM work on magic angle film by, you know, the, Pathy group, also by the Ivan Reis group, you know, and by, by uh, Stefan Natsperch. Ivan Ray mentioned it in particular in her talk, in her lecture uh, this past Monday, okay? So we have, you know, we seem to have, and here's where these two topics that I have spoken about so far come together. If in a phase diagram of temperature versus doping in magic angle thing, we have this correlating insulator state and we have this superconducting dome. Now we have this region of normal state anisotropy, nematicity, okay? This happens in the normal state and it happens over a relatively narrow density range, okay? Which at zero intercepts roughly about 10% doping from you know, zero doping. That normal state region seems to deplete TC in the superconducting dome. So there seems to be competition between whatever is creating this normal state an isotropic state and a superconducting state. Separately, everywhere in the superconducting dome, there is nematicity in the superconducting state, okay? Now this nematicity in the superconducting state seems to be of different origin to the nematicity in the normal state, okay? Because it happens everywhere in the superconducting dome, including regions where in the normal state there doesn't seem to be nematicity above it. However, it's important to note that the nematicity axis, okay, the orientation of this ellipse changes direction. And in particular, it changes direction, the major axis changes direction most dramatically. It changes and wiggles a little bit direction around here, but it changes rapidly and very strongly in this region. In the region of the superconducting dome where there is normal state nematicity above it, and if you suppress superconductivity, there is normal state nematicity there, okay? So it seems that what's happening is that you have in this region of the superconducting dome, you develop nematicity. These ellipses are pinned by something, probably a little bit of strain or disorder. But of course, this nematicity doesn't originate in the strain because it's rotated, okay? And strain is fixed. We don't change the strain in our sample with open. So this ellipse is rotating a little bit, but then you reach the density region where you have normal state nematicity. You have another anisotropy, which is being set by another phenomenon, okay? And then your superconducting order parameter, boom, decides to align, you know, strongly with whatever order is competing here and it's setting your anisotropy axis here, okay? And this is what happens. Now, Raphael went over the theory of, of you know, the, the, the three-state POTS model and, and, and what situations and what happens and how do you, you know, align the you know, director axis compared to any other axis that you may have in your system and describe all these properties. So now I'm gonna go through it. You know, he did a really wonderful job. Um, he didn't emphasize too much and I'm also not going to emphasize it because you know, I, I like to talk about things that have been proven experimentally and we don't have evidence for it. But in principle, okay, nematicity in the superconducting state has deep implications for what is the superconducting, for what are the possible superconducting order parameters of the system, okay? And, and you can read more about that uh, 
in, in, in our paper, you know, this is only suggestions, but it is, it makes it sort of hard for it to be a conventional S wave order parameter. Okay. But of course, this still needs to, you know, it's one of the key questions in the field, what's the symmetry of the other parameter and it's still to be investigated. Okay. So let me tell you now. Hello. Uh, Pablo, yep. I, I think we have just two quick questions concerning sure. this last part. One is by Christian uh, Novakovsky. Uh, Christian, I think you can talk now. If... Uh, hello, yes. I, 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 had, I actually have two questions. One is about this um, resistance maps in BX and B, BY. There is, uh, in a non superconductive state, there is um, a high resistance dot in the upper left corner of the maps. I was just wondering what, what is that feature? Let me see if I can go where, sorry? Two slides back when you showed the, a, a lot of maps of resistance as a function of BX, BY. Okay. This? Yes, this. So in, in panels A, B, C, F, G, for example, there is this high oh, resistance. That, that particular dot there? Yeah, I... Honestly, I, I don't know, you know, it's a, this, this little dot here. I don't know what it is to be honest. Um, okay. This is a particular, this, this will be a particular angle, you know, so we choose an angle and then we take all these dopings and this is a particular angle and it may be that a particular angle, you know, something happened during the measurement. Um, I'm not sure. I, you know, I don't think it has relevance, but. Uh, okay. Yeah, and I have another question just to the, to the last slides you, you were showing. Uh, what is the angle between the two directors of the mm -hmm. LHS, uh, in the pneumatic and non pneumatic state? Okay, so there, yeah, as, um, yeah, let me go to that slide. Now, this is a particular ellipse taken at a particular doping, okay? This angle actually varies over a range of around 20, 30 degrees over this range, okay? So don't take the angle between this particular and this particular axis to be, uh, um, you know, as one angle, because this varies and this, the angle is varying rapidly. You have the continuous evolution of how the angle is varying for every doping and at different temperatures in this paper, okay? It, you know, between here, let's say between the average angle here and the average angle here, this seems to be about a 60 degree, you know, you know, you know, you know again, there's a range, you know, there's between 60 and 90 degrees, you know, varies the angle between here and here, okay? So it's a strong variation of the angle and it's mostly rapidly varying there, okay? So it's hard to say that it's fixed to some external strain or... Um, well, no, so it's not fixed to some external strain. No, because strain would not depend on the density of the electron in your system, okay? There may be a strain that locally, you know, the fact that you see an ellipse here or here, okay? Uh -huh. If the system was truly spontaneously, you know, choosing a particular angle, if there was nothing pinning that ellipse, you would not really be seeing the lips. You would be carrying the rotation of the lips with you, so to speak. Okay, because if all angles are exactly identical, you know, in the system, you know, would, would not be with the you know, parallel field. You would be sort of dragging the lips if you want. Okay, so the fact that you know at some point it chooses an angle means that there is a little bit of strain that fixes it. But again, we go back to the lecture by Raphael, you know, what's the chicken and what's the egg? Okay, the fact that this angle can vary with density it means it's not strain, which is actually pinning it, okay? Mm -hmm. It's something else, you know, that it's pinning it. Uh, I mean, that it's making the evolution of the rotation axis. I think we have uh, another question by Yuval Ronen uh, about the time reversal symmetry. Yuval, can you? Hi, Yuval. Hi. Hi, Pablo. I just, I wanted to ask, how do we know, like, uh, the difference between nematicity and uh, uh, being wave or, or, or a time reversal uh, breaking superconductor. What mm -hmm. would be a measurement that distinguish between the two? Mm -hmm. Well, the, these two things don't have to be, you, the, sorry, I, I, I do cut for a moment. Did you ask what's the difference between nematicity and a P wave or D wave superconductor? Did you say something yes. like that? Yes, okay. yes. These things, 
are not, you know, it's not that one is different from the other, okay? In the following sense. I mean, th these are two different things. You know, nematicity tells you that you go from whatever lattice rotational symmetry your crystal had, you know, fourfold for square lattice, you know, threefold, you know, sixfold, whatever lattice rotational symmetry you had to twofold. You choose a direction, you have an ellipse, okay? An ellipse or, or, or a peanut in your properties. Only one axis of symmetry, C2 symmetry. So you choose a direction, okay? Now, this is something that can be caused by various different things. In particular, it can be caused by order parameters which are known as wave, okay? But you can have nematicity due to P wave order parameters, due to D wave order parameters, due to various types of order parameters, okay? So, and what I would say is that seeing nematicity in the superconducting state, at least you know, theoretically, indicates, it's a strong indication that there is a non-S wave order parameter, you know, and purely S wave order parameter doesn't give you an isotropy, you know, of your superconducting state properties with things like parallel magnetic field, okay? So, nematicity indicates, you know, is an indication that you may have a non-S wave order parameter, okay? Of course, if you have very strong strain and S wave or the parameter, you could have anisotropies in your superconducting state, okay? But that would be a trivial way of um, nematicity, you know? It's, it's just imposed structurally by the external strain. But if you have something which, for example, rotates, you know, your pneumatic axis rotates, okay? That cannot be, you know, that's highly unlikely to be done to be due to an external strain or something like that. And then it indicates that it might be one of those superconducting other parameters. You can find a discussion about specifically which order parameters could be more likely, okay? But again, it's just a suggestion. I want to emphasize, I like to distinguish very much between theory and experiment, okay? One thing is what you measure experimentally, another thing what it suggests theoretically, but you can see a discussion of what possible order parameters, okay? You can have for this system given what we see in this paper, okay? And it is indeed a, a you know, the P wave or D wave, okay? With the particular, you know, even within P wave and D wave, there are different symmetries, you know, uh, for different cases. I think Thanks. we should uh, we should maybe go on and then come back if there are more questions later, if you're fine with it. Thanks, Pablo. Okay, so in in the last few minutes, let me tell you uh, a little bit about our recent study of phase transitions, and this was again done in uh, close collaboration with you know a wonderful group of researchers at the Weizmann Institute led by Shahali Larni. So this is sort of the face, you know, a, a different cartoon of the face diagram that I mentioned uh, earlier, okay? This is the, you know, filling factor here, zero, one, two, three, four, band insulators, charge neutrality point where you have a Dirac semi-metal, sometimes a Dirac insulator, depending on conditions. You have a filling factor one, typically a correlated semi-metal state here. Sometimes you see something, sometimes you don't. And the correlated insulator state at two minus two and also at three, sometimes at minus three are quite prevalent. Superconducting domes, sometimes you have other superconducting domes, strange metal. So this is, you know, what happens at low temperature, you know, and this strange metal thing is seen up to high temperature. Let me tell you what happens when you investigate uh, with a thermodynamic probe, in particular, when you measure the compressibility of the system, what extra insight this gives you. And this was just published very recently, you know, and uh, you know, the only reason you, know, you, you saw already this, this was back to back papers together with Ali Yazdani's STM experiment. Very similar results with very two complementary techniques, you know, compre, you know compress, local compressibility using a scanning SCT, and this is STM work. And, you know, this was published uh, on my birthday, you know, so I, I like very much <laughs> this paper. It was a nice birthday present, you know. So, let me tell you, you know, the electronic compressibility, you know, not everybody might be familiar with, with this. I don't think, you know, it, it was mentioned a little bit in, in Alan McDonald's talk, but let me tell you a bit more. So electronic compressibility is D and D mu, okay? How does, you know, the density of your system changes when you change the chemical uh, potential, okay? And in a single particle, in a, in a single particle picture, this is directly proportional to the density of states of your system. Huh? Now, in our experiments, we measure the inverse compressibility, d mu dn. How does the chemical potential change as you change the number of carriers in your system, okay? But it's, you know, it's just one over this. So you should think of this as one over density of states. Therefore, the phenomenology is the following. 
if you have an energy gap, since you have very little density of states, you should have a zero incompressibility or a peak, a maximum in the mu dn. If you have a Dirac like dispersion, is also a low density of states. So you should have a minimum in compress compressibility or a maximum in the mu dn. And in particular, a maximum that is proportional to the density, you know, one of the square root of the density. So a maximum that decreases in a particular way. If you have superconductivity, you actually don't measure anything in a, with a thermodynamic probe, at least you know, to zeroth order um, incompressibility. Okay, superconductivity is a gap that appears always at the Fermi energy. It's not a gap which is there, you know, in a thermodynamic sense. So let me tell you about our experiments. So these are experiments where the group of Shahalilani has a scanning carbon nanotube single electron transistor. Basically, it has a local, very sensitive charge detector or electric field detector, okay? voltage detector. Okay? So we have our magic angle graphene device here. We have a back gate. We have the scanning NCT, which is a nanotube, you know, very short nanotube. So it has a large charging energy when you cool down. This gives it extreme sensitivity to electric fields. So now you're varying the back gates and you're measuring the response on your NCT as you charge the varied density of carriers in the graphene, okay? And then you see what is the effect. This is a device that you can also do transport in this device, okay? I have to say that, you know, Shahal had been asking us for, for, for a long time for devices. We've been trying to get devices to many people like Eli Seldov also, he mentioned in his talk. And unfortunately we were a little bit behind. So we just sent a device to Shahal without characterizing it or anything. We just said, look, we just have this device. Let me send it, let us send it to you see whether it works at all, and then we'll send you a better device later on, okay? So it turns out this device um, was not great, but it was good enough for what we wanted to see, and now he has much better devices, so we're seeing wonderful new things, which we'll report soon. Um, but if, you know, you can measure here the resistance versus magnetic field, and I should say that in his scanning setup, the magnetic field is parallel to the graphene plane. He doesn't have perpendicular magnetic field for that, initial experiment. So if you measure, you know, resistivity versus parallel magnetic field, you can see, you know, this is the direct point, this is the insulator state at two electrons and two holes per more unit cell, and you have these superconducting domes for electrons and for holes, okay? So not a great device, but a good enough for what we did. And the nice thing in particular that he could do is that because he has this scanning SET and it's a very small device, he can actually go along the device and measure what's the twist angle. Okay, the presence of this band insulator tells you what's the, the twist angle. And you can see that, you know, in this device over one micron is pretty uniform at this twist angle, which is actually a little bit towards smaller range. But then you see these twist angles in different regions and different traces. Okay, this is a 3D map of this. Okay, again, this device is a little bit more disordered than we would have liked. You know, this was uncharacterized when we sent it to him. Now he has devices where he has uniform twist angles for, you know, seven, eight, 10 microns at the time, you know, exquisite devices. And the devices are 30 or so microns. He can move to another patch with slightly different twist angle and do much, much better uh, spectroscopy that we hope we will report soon on, on wonderful new data. This is a measurement of the dmu dn, this black trace. As I told you in the earlier phenomenology, gaps appear as these sharp peaks. Charge neutrality point, the Dirac cone, appears also as a peak because of low density of states, so large inverse compressibility, and it decays in a special way. You can see extra wiggles. We're going to see those extra wiggles in a moment. If you integrate this inverse compressibility, you get the actual chemical potential of the system as a function of density, okay? And you can see these, you know, steps in chemical potential at each of these features. So now, this is we're zooming in on this data. This is a measurement of the inverse compressibility as a function of position and filling factor. You can see the filling factor axis here, zero, one, two, three, four electrons per more unit cell, one, two, three, four holes per more unit cell. You can see how these features, now that they are normalized to filling factor, they all fall along straight lines, okay? And you can see that the most salient features are these large peaks and the central peak charge neutrality, okay? But now you can see in the zoom in, okay? And this is again for sample A and for another device sample B. This is the second device, which much higher quality and you can see much 
you know, many more features. We're only showing here a subset. These are data at finite parallel magnetic field because for this device A, the features were stabilized under a parallel magnetic field. But now in sample B, I'll show you data in a moment. This happens, all of these features are there even at zero magnetic field. So you can see that the features in inverse compressibility vary a lot with very small magnetic field vari um, twist angle variations, okay? And this is again a local measurement. So the twist angle is uniform of this local region where you know, we're scanning. So for 0 0.99 degrees, which we're barely, and you know, we just barely entered the magic angle range, okay? There's relatively few features, a little bit here, okay? In the correlated in the flat bands. Whereas if you go to a, you know, twist angle, for example, 1.13 degrees in this higher quality sample or 107 or 105, you see these peaks, asymmetric peaks in compressibility, in inverse compressibility, okay? And lots of features and lots of things happening. If you integrate again these curves, you can see that the chemical potential versus filling factor for 0 0.99 degrees, it just follows this square root and you know, pretty much from charge neutrality here. And then you have small undulations, but you know, barely anything there. Whereas if you are deep into the magic angle range, you have these strong steps in your chemical potential versus density, okay, versus filling factor. Strong steps which sort of repeat themselves, you know, are telling us that something is happening, okay? Let me, as I told you, in these higher quality devices that we're looking at now, even at zero parallel magnetic field, you have all of these features present, okay, that were shown here earlier in a finite parallel magnetic field. Now you can do also temperature dependence of these inverse compressibility peaks. I'm showing here only uh, for electron doping, okay? And you can see that these peaks persist all the way to 16 Kelvin. In fact, we have now evidence that they persist to you know, all the way to 40, 50 Kelvin, something like that. So this is something that is happening at temperatures well above the superconducting temperatures, well above the correlated insulator temperatures, okay? It's a high temperature phenomenon, but of course this has big consequences for the framing of what is happening at those temperatures. Okay, so how do we interpret these peaks, okay? So, the simplest model that we could come up with, and it's again zero or, or you know zero or first order, you know, and a lot of people are now doing theory to better understand the features that are present in this model, is the following: there is a cascade of phase transition and, and so-called and Dirac revivals, we call it, in the evolution of the system as a function of failure. So let's start from charge neutrality. Okay, charge neutrality. You know that you have these four flavors, you know, spin and valley in magic angle graphene. Okay, so as you start adding charge to the system, okay, all of these four flavors are being filled at the same time. You are putting a few electrons from charge neutrality, you're putting a few electrons in each of these flavors, in each of these zero cones, all four being filled at the same time, at the same rate, slowly up, 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 okay? Now, when you are close to having each of these flavors one quarter filled, Okay, remember, four electrons fill completely those Dirac cones. So when you're close to filling one quarter each, which means total filling factor one, the system suddenly undergoes a phase transition. It decides it is advantageous for me to break the symmetry between these four flavors and just fill one flavor completely and empty all other three flavors, okay? So this is something the system decides to, oh, I'm going to actually start filling one flavor completely and I empty all three other flavors, okay? So this is something that is happening and then the chemical potential, you know, after it reaches here and fills one of the flavors completely, gets completely reset to charge neutrality. This is this Dirac revival. So the system looks again as if it is at charge neutrality point, okay? And then it continues. You start filling the remaining you know, in the simplest model, the remaining three flavors, it could be actually somewhat more complicated. We have some indications now that it may be more complicated, but let's say in the simplest interpretation, you start filling the other remaining three flavors uniformly. When you are near nu equals two, which means you have put almost one third of an electron in each of the three remaining flavors, okay? The system 
decides to do the same thing again. Oh, rather than filling the remaining three flavors uniformly, I'm going to, again, break the symmetry between these remaining three flavors, fill one completely and empty the other two so that we go back to charge neutrality. We go back to charge neutrality and so on and so forth. Now these two flavors get filled and you know, this can happen depending on parameters as a first order, second order phase transition. There are many details that you can look at in the papers, you know, on the theory, but the system decides to fill the remaining last two flavors. When it is about to reach half of this, each of these flavors, the system again decides to fill, spontaneously break the symmetry and fill one flavor and then go to charge neutrality and then the last flavor is filled, okay? So this is something that you know, this, this inverse compressibility studies you know, with Shahad, you know, and, and our collaboration with the theory colleagues really is, you know, was very insightful because it helped, you know, it provided insight to something that we had already seen actually in our original uh, transport data, transport experiments, and that has been also reproduced by many others, which is the ground state of your system is very different when you dope the density. As you vary your filling factor, right before you reach the correlated insulated states and right after you, your correlated insulated states, your ground state properties, your ground state system, the ground state of your system is very different actually. So this was already present in our original, you know, 2018 papers, you know. For example, we had seen that the land of fan diagrams, okay, if you look at the resistivity versus magnetic field and carrier density, and you look at you know, your Shunikov has oscillations, here is the correlated insulator state. This is charge neutrality. This is the band insulator. We had already seen that from charge neutrality or from the band insulator, the degeneracy of your lambda levels is fourfold. So you have this flavor, you know, fourfold flavor symmetry. Whereas at nu equals minus two, you have twofold lambda level degeneracy. Okay? So you have broken your symmetry. And now you have two rather than fourfold symmetry. Okay, this was already present there when you measured, you know, the friction of the mechanical oscillations, the 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 you know the effective mass of the system. There is a reset, and I remember my my friend and colleague sent it to Dardy telling me this big reset is like if the system is completely changing at this doping. Okay, so there is a phase transition, and indeed we have now evidence, direct evidence, that there is indeed a phase transition. In fact, also in our original paper, we had this data, this is in the supplementary information of the paper, of a Fermi surface reconstruction present in whole measurements. When you do RXY measurements at small magnetic field, look at, you know, this is complicated because it has the complete temperature dependence, but yet look, just look at this black trace. It is a big reset of the whole density, indicating that reconstruction from a large Fermi surface to small Fermi surface here which of course now with this inverse compressibility measurements, we know that it has to do with the system having, you know, a flavor, you know, a large Dirac Fermi surface because it has, you know, it is occupying, you know, the Dirac cone, it resetting now to near charge neutrality point, okay, in this Dirac revival, okay? So this, this studies, you know, show how tremendously rich the system is and Again, if this is the previous phase diagram, now, thanks to these studies, and again, Ali has done experiment have, have reached pretty much the same conclusions with a very different technique, so this is very robust. We have now a new phase diagram where already at high temperatures, at least temperatures of order 30 Kelvin, probably actually higher, we have a flavor symmetry broken parent state before and after each integer here, okay? And that is the background on which all of these low temperature physics, okay, correlated insulated states, simple conducting states, et cetera, develops at low temperature, okay? So there, of course, you know, as you saw in, in Ashwin this one talk and in, you know, several other talks, there are interesting models proposed for the origin of the correlated insulated state, for the origin of superconductivity, and plenty of them have actually a spontaneously, you know, broken symmetry, you know, along different flavors, you know, uh, in this direction, we have now direct evidence that indeed there is spontaneous, you know, open symmetry and phase transitions across each of the correlated, you know, across each integer filling factor. So I think I'm pretty much at the end of my time. I'm, I'm going to skip um, these, the strange metal 
behavior. I just, you know, let me just go. I just wanna, okay, this is maybe just slide to stop. Again, this is published so you can look at it. You know, if you measure the resistivity versus temperature near this correlated insulated region, and this is in particular, uh, you know, above a uh, 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 small superconducting dome, you see this beautiful, perfectly linear behavior. If you have high TC, of course, the, the linear resistivity behavior deviates once you reach superconductivity, okay? And, you know, a number of people have looked at this. If you go near charge neutrality, the behavior is quadratic, so it's not linear. And as Alan McDonald mentioned in his point, you know, some people are trying to explain it with phonons, but it seems the more you, the better and better you do a calculation of phonons, the less likely the phonons are. And, and I'm, I'm happy that, you know, Alan has this other model with collective excitations. Let's see if, if those, you know, of, of more electronic origin can give us uh, uh, some insight. I'm looking forward to Alan's paper in the archive, hopefully next week. Um, so let me leave you with the summary. So the system, you know, as in many correlated materials, there's a competition between different orders, okay? And this depends on, you know, what is your, you know, twist angle, which controls the, the uh, interaction energy scale over the bandwidth. It depends on parameters, you know, like also on disorder. It depends on what's the density you're feeling. Okay? There is nematicity, in particular anisotropies, both in the superconducting state and in the normal state. And they seem to be of independent origins, but they coexist in some regions of the phase diagram and affect each other. Yeah? And these local inverse compressibility measurements indicate a cascade of phase transitions and derived revivals at each integer field factor. This is the parent state out of which all the ground state and many body physics at lower temperature occurs. The change of the behavior near the correlated insulator states. And more importantly, as it was, I think, emphasized very nicely in Elie Seldov's talk, there is substantial sensitivity of all of this to the precise twist angle, to twist angle and chemical potential disorder and other parameters, you know, that, that you can vary in the system, okay? And other systems like twisted bilayer, bilayer, for example, have sensitivity to electric field. There are many other systems you can vary other parameters. And I think we're slowly figuring out which parameters affect more strongly which aspect of the physics, you know, and it's a very rich system. So with this, let me go to the most important slide. I think this is acknowledgement to, you know, to my group members and collaborators. Um, the work that I showed was mostly done by my grad student, Joan Sal, who defended his thesis yesterday, um, together in collaboration with Daniel Rodan and Jane Park, and also with some other uh, group members, Oriol and uh, collaborators in Reassury Group, Spencer, Ahmed, and our theory collaborators, Liam Fu uh, and Noah, the Banjan and, and Sentil. Also Rafael Fernandez, uh, who has you know, tremendous insight on the nematicity and, and, and you know, really great to discuss with him. Our uh, single particle band structures are calculated by Sean Fang and uh, Tim Kaxiras. We get the uh, HVN from our Japanese collaborators and this compressive, inverse compressibility studies uh, were done in very close collaboration uh, with Shahali Lani and Yuri Saf, et cetera, and theory support from Yuval Adiris and Felix. And although I didn't speak about them because Eddie mentioned them already in this talk, you know, I went very, you know, at length, uh, he, he, you know, he explained in detail our experiments. We have also very close collaboration with Eli Seldov on the scanning nanoscript technique and Abiram and, and Samuel Gover. So this is a fantastic group of colleagues at Wiseman and we have, a, you know, we really enjoy our collaboration with them. And yeah, I want to thank also support by various foundations and, and government agencies. And I want to thank you for your attention. Thanks a lot, Pablo. A very nice talk. I see uh, quite a lot of questions. So let's go uh, straight to the point. I see a question from Anan, uh, Shane Fuchs, that says he cannot speak and he found the talk very interesting. And he's asking you, how much does the twist angle vary in this sample? So this sample was uh, the sample where you showed the uh, nematicity. And he's asking how much angle variance would you expect in the nematicity ellipse? Mm -hmm. Very good. So unfortunately, we do not have local information on the twist angle for each of the devices that we measure, okay? Because we cannot do uh, scanning local, you know. So you can measure the twist angle via different techniques, STM, um, scanning SET, scanning nanoscreed, as Ellie has shown. You know, we, you know we, we fabricate some devices, we send them to Wiseman. Sometimes we go ourselves also to help at Wiseman. But 
you know, then the device is, a single device is being measured for many months, you know, sometimes even a year or more at Weissman. So this is a very slow process for characterization and we cannot do this for each of the devices that we measure. You know, we measure dozens of devices at MIT and we cannot, we don't have local angle information for each of them. So for that particular pneumaticity uh, uh, device, we do not have information on the local twist angle variation. Something that gives you an, an, you know, an, a, a range, you know, gives you an estimate for the variation in twist angle is when you measure the lambda fan diagrams, okay, you can look at how well defined your lambda fan diagrams are, okay, and what's the variation in your tunic of the Hass oscillations, and that gives you a range of twist angle, okay? So for that pneumaticity study that we're doing, again, it depends on which device you were referring to because we have several devices and I show data from several devices, but 0 0.02 degrees is the variation in twist angle, mm. okay? okay? Now, the lips rotates over 90 degrees, okay? So this 0 0.02 degrees variation in twist angle does not give you a 90 degrees variation mm -hmm. in the lips, okay? So it's a completely different scales, you know, in terms of twist angle and, and ellipse rotation angle. Thanks, Pablo. I see uh, there are very few time and uh, many questions. So let's go to the question of Adrian uh, Bastold. Adrian, can you, can you speak hi, now? Adrian. Yeah, hi. Uh, so uh, do you have an explanation why there is a phase transition at integer feeling factor? So oh. why do you currently feel all the yeah. state one flavor? Yes, um, let, let, me, let me see if I can, how do I exit? I wanna show you a hidden slide. So there is, there is a simple theoretical model in our paper. So I refer you to look at it for details, okay? But we saw that, you know, our theory collaborators saw that you can capture the basics, zeroth order, okay? There are many details that are missed by this explanation, but zeroth order, you can capture the basics of this by assuming a simple model where you have these flat bands, these flat bands, you know, and, and we, you know, we use an effective model where you have essentially Dirac cones which then abruptly terminate, okay? So you see this linear density of states which then abruptly terminate to sort of represent this more realistic, you know, band structure, okay? So if you include that and on-site interactions and you use a simple mean field model, okay? You can capture this spontaneous, you know, symmetry breaking at each integer, okay? Again, this looks substantially different from the experimental data, but the fact that there is a drop to zero inverse compressibility followed by a peak, which then decreases in a Dirac fashion, and then another drop, and then another peak, which decreases. And the details here depend on whether this is first order, or second order phase transition, there's a leaf sheet transition or not, et cetera. But this sort of behavior with these asymmetric peaks where the system chemical potential goes back to charge neutrality is captured in a simple model where you need to have a critical value of interactions, okay, in order to realize this, okay? And you have also plots there of the chemical potential, et cetera. We know now that you need to add things to this model, exchange interactions and several other things to more properly uh, uh, explain the data, but this series of the model where you have strong on-site interactions, okay, and a particular flat band density of states is sufficient to explain to zero order what is going on in the system, why the system decides to spontaneously choose one flavor and leave the others empty. Thanks, Pablo. I see a uh, next question from Oscar Vafek. I see you have two questions, Oscar, and I may ask you to, to ask only one. I think we have already, we are running out of time. Okay, Pablo, uh, could you elaborate on the revivals away from new equal to one from the higher quality device? You said it is more involved than in the published data. Uh, sorry, I couldn't, you cut a little bit, I couldn't hear you. Can you repeat your question? Yes, uh, could you elaborate on the revivals away from new equal to one from the higher quality device? You said that it is more involved than in mm -hmm. the published data. <laughs> I, I'm afraid uh, Shahal wouldn't let me speak about it. Um, we're finishing the experiment. It's extremely interesting, and you will have to wait a little bit to see. I'm sorry, but you know, this is okay, so let me ask, let me ask the question that maybe I can get an answer to. 
Uh, so are there any indications of the temperature dependence of the anisotropy from uh, the local probes? Let me just say yes. Yeah, and again, it's part of this thing that we're doing. Uh, I'm sorry, oh, I, I if, you know, if it was me, I would decide freely, but it's Shahal, you know, yeah. I, I would have to ask Shahal before answering uh, questions about the, 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 these better devices, which are showing a lot of extra very rich physics, so. Okay, thank you. Okay, well, soon we've got more information, I guess. Um, I think it's time to wrap up because uh, we are a bit running out of time. And um, I see there are a few more questions. I encourage you to maybe contact Pablo directly if you want. Um, we will um, now move to the very last session of, the, of this two-week conference, which is a, a round table in which uh, Pablo and Maciek and Frank and uh, Dima Ifetov are also a part of. So I encourage you all to, to follow this. And, uh, and to contribute and ask all the, all the questions you want. But for now, let's thank Pablo again. And uh, really, it was a very nice talk. And thank see you, very you much. in 10 minutes. OK, thank you very much. We're going to end the meeting now. And uh, we will see you in the last session of the symposium, uh, the discussion table. I'm going to end the meeting now. Thank you. Thank you, Pablo. Thank you, everyone.